On the show today, I have my friend David, and I met David back in 2017 at a business conference. I've seen him speak a few times, and every time that I have heard David speak, I feel like time stops because he is so genuine and so passionate and wants his audience and his students to be able to push through discomfort, to be able to find it within them to to be their best self, to follow their heart, to to push through, like I said. And he has so much heart. And you're going to see that today. Um, I am just so proud of everything that David has created and all the people that he has helped in this world. And I just want to say, you know, there is a big goal of my show, which is that we have open and honest conversations. And that is exactly what you're going to find today. And we talk about a lot. There's a lot of honesty and a lot of open conversations. Anywhere from, is the world going to end in 10 to 15 years? <laughs> All to uh, the show, Joe Millionaire. Okay, we're covering a lot in this episode. So I am really excited for you to hear. I learned there was like David had a couple of uh, excellent points that hit home for me and really made me thoughtful. So I can't wait for you to listen to this. Um, before we dive in, I'd love to introduce you to my guest, David. After a 36-year career in radio, David H. Lawrence the 17th moved to television and has been seen on FX's The People vs. OJ, ABC's epic series Lost, CBS's legendary CSI, The Mentalist, The Bold and the Beautiful, the military thriller The Unit, NBC's spy comedy Chuck, Good Luck Charlie and Ant Farm on Disney, Touch and the Finder on Fox, and is best known as the creepy, evil puppet master Eric Doyle on NBC's smash hit Heroes. His film career includes on-camera and voiceover work on Cars 3, Straight Outta Compton, Men in Black 3, Pizza Man, The Changeling, The Hulk, Iron Man, Percy Jackson, Unstoppable, Too Big to Fail, A Special Relationship, and countless more. His acting site is David H. Lawrence xvii.com. David helps actors create their own voiceover careers with his award-winning voheroes.com training program and has been backstage's reader's choice for favorite VO teacher and favorite VO demo producer for four years in a row. He teaches in Los Angeles and online via voheroes.com. Again, I think you're going to love this open and honest and funny and emotional and uh, passionate conversation with David. So let's get this party started. Are you ready to open up and talk about all things business? I'm Crystal Vilkaitis, a curious entrepreneur who loves talking about business, especially over a glass of wine. I started Crystal and Cork to share open and honest conversations about my journey and talk to other entrepreneurs about their experiences. We pull back the curtain and talk about the highs and the lows. Wine isn't required, but is recommended. This is Crystal Uncorked. David, welcome to Crystal Uncorked. I'm so thrilled you're here. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, of course. I am so looking forward to our conversation. Um, before we dive in, we've got some juicy questions. I love these questions that we're going to uh, talk about today. I want to know, what are you drinking? Oh, I uh, I ducked out to Starbucks uh, and got myself a venti mocha, skim, no whip, uh, three shot. And, um, and I caught the barista doing something right. Uh, I always love catching people doing something right. Uh, if you'll notice, this is the I'm, I'm sipping from this side. Mm. Beautiful. But if you'll notice, the seam of the cup is over here. Oh. And I watched him examine my cup before he put the lid on to do this. And when he gave me my cup, he sa- I said, I know what you're doing. Because <laughs> I've dripped mocha on my dress shirt before out that. Yep. And here's the real thing. That's like you you made the mistake of asking what I'm drinking. So I used to work for America Online. And back in the 90s, mid 90s, Starbucks was the very first. Well, it was the second. Sprint was the first. But the very one of the very early companies that had areas, commercial areas on America Online, sponsored areas. And I was their producer. 
So I flew out to Seattle and they put me through barista training and we met with their marketing oh. team and all this stuff. It was really great. And yeah. um, and I related a story as they were putting the lid on. I said, no, no, hold on, hold on. To turn the lid a little bit. Here's why. And I, you know, I put it where they had it and I, and I tilted it and I showed them what was going on. And their head of training was in this meeting and he goes, oh, my God. And when they put their when they put their marketing stuff around their training on it, we even teach our baristas how to put your cup properly, put the lid properly on your cup. And I'm like, I did. That was I I shared that with them. I helped make them a better company. So anyway, man, now we know where that came from. David Lords, everybody. This is amazing. I had no idea, but it's so true. I can't tell you how many times I have spilled on myself when they do that. I am. I'm very happy to hear that you had an excellent barista today at Starbucks. Good for him. Stefan. And uh, I have some wine. What's that? Oh, really? What a surprise. You have some wine. Uh, Isn't that shocking? It is. Isn't that shocking? What what are we drinking today? um, What's your... your... We... I'm curious what you think because, I mean, really, I... Season one, somebody recommended doing wines from Costco because wine ha- Costco has some really great wines. Sure. And um, so, so far, my season has pretty much been all Costco wines except for one. So today I have a Canty Classico. It's a 2016. It's doc labeled. And I'm saying this because, David, I know you used to be a sommelier, right? Or still are a sommelier? I, no, I mean, I'm how not does that any work? Longer. I, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to, you know, order properly. Um, but yeah, for a while there in the early eighties, so it's a little fuzzy, uh, in the early eighties, uh, I was a wine captain and a sommelier and, uh, I ended my career as a sommelier just after they released, uh, Opus One at Mondavi. And, uh, there's a story to that. Maybe we'll get into it. Okay. Okay. I think we should. Um, <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> I think we should. <laughs> I love it. I mean, David, I know this story. I feel like we should actually just start with it and then we're going to dive into this business stuff. But tell the people what okay. happened. So this is you. this falls in the category of uh, putting your foot so far in your mouth that you <laughs> can't get it out. Um, so I was I was a sommelier at a city club in Stamford, Connecticut, and I got invited out to Mondavi uh, for the release of Opus One. They, they weren't saying what they were releasing. They just said, we have a big announcement and blah, blah, blah. So I go there and I bring a friend of mine from Columbus, Ohio, who's also a wine connoisseur, not a sommelier, but a, a, a connoisseur. And uh, we're talking and I'm tasting Opus One. Now, Vineyards, wineries, uh, they will release a wine just a little shy of it being amazing because they want it to get out there. They want it to mature. They want it to sit on people's shelves and be inviting and, you know, have them turn the label so that they can see what they've invested in and all that stuff. These are all reasons, by the way, that I got out of the business because it was all about selling upselling wines and Mm. Jeroboam's and Methuselah's and being a a show place instead of, you know, actually enjoying the wine with the food Um, for for some people. For others, it was all about that. But anyway, so I'm standing there. There's got to be 100 people at Mustard's, which is where they held the event. It was a uh, a restaurant in Napa Valley. And uh, I'm standing there. I'm talking to my friend John. And I'm like, I'm drinking this. And I'm like, you know, I, I get that this is like their big deal. This is like the big deal of, I think it was 1985. I'm not sure. Um, and, uh, but it, 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 it tastes like a gamay. It was really round and fruity and, and, and soft. And I said, it, you know, and John's like, shut up. I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> no, really, that's what it tastes like to me. Shut up. Robert Mondavi was standing directly behind me. And apparently he heard what I said. Oh, boy. I was, I was, uh, what did you do? Politely asked, politely asked to leave. So I left. Oh, he did ask you to leave. Yeah, he did. Oh, dang. He said, if you don't like it, you can leave. Oh, dang. And you know what? He should have said that to me. Even though I was being completely (laughs) and totally honest, how dare I disrespect a host on the day on a big day, on a really big day. And to my defense, 
I was like 26, 27, something like that. I don't know. I was stupid and young and, uh, and, and I, I should have handled it better. So yeah. Well, it's a great way to start I mean, an interview. It's pretty, Thank you so much. It's a great, yes, we're <laughs> getting, we're getting right in. Don't you love being on the show, David? Yeah. Um, I, but that is so, I don't know. I, I think it's so interesting. I, the fact we all have such different taste buds and have what we think about different wines and you were just being honest, but that yeah. was probably fun to be there at the very least and uh and get to be a part of that and i love that you have some wine experience but that's not where you are now like you said you're not in that career anymore so will you tell us i know you're a multi-passionate entrepreneur you're into a lot of different things and tell us how you got started in the industry that you're in and, and what you do uh so for the longest time even going back to uh high school um, both entertainment and technology were weaving their way through my entire life. Uh, I was in the drama club in high school. I was a radio uh, DJ starting at age 16, 17. Uh, I was a club DJ in the 70s when being a club DJ was huge. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, between my uh, junior year and senior year in high school, I worked at NASA uh, in the uh, at in Cleveland at their wind tunnel, um, worked on the Skylab project, um, and uh, so technology. I went to Ohio State for computer and information science and broadcast communications. So that's the kind of stuff. And then, isn't it cool how technology kind of took over uh, entertainment in general in terms of both production, distribution, promotion. Um, you know, the word of mouth that we used to have when we would go to school or to work and talk about a show on television has been replaced by Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and and the production totally. as well. Like, I don't know if you've ever used Ecamm Live for yeah. doing yeah. Oh, man. It's, okay. Yeah, it's awesome. So Ecamm Live, most, most people don't know this, but in the world of radio, DJs, you'll see them in studios. They'll shoot video of, of DJs in studios. Sometimes, very rarely, it depends what market you're in, uh, there are engineers on the other side of the glass running the board, opening people's mics and playing sounds and doing all that. But for the most part, DJs do what's called combo control. They open their own mics. They, they put sound effects up. They play them just at the right time to do things. They play the music. They, you know, they, do, they do everything. They play all the commercials. And that's what Ecamm Live is, is running your own board. Yeah. And that wasn't possible to do for the longest time, you know? Right. Um, but now it is. And the industry has kind of moved toward the creator and the creator has moved toward the industry. Um, but my early life was all about uh, making people laugh, making people cry and making people back up their hard drives. That was that was what I did. <laughs> And I worked at uh, America Online and Google and Yahoo and Excited Home, which was the first uh, broadband communications company, all the while having a radio show uh, where I did mornings for the longest time when I was doing local radio. And then I got into syndicated radio where I did a talk show about technology. And I did that right mm -hmm. up until 2005 or six. Uh, but somewhere along the line there, while I was doing radio and not my face wasn't being seen, except when somebody local in Washington, D.C., which is where I lived, wanted to hire me to be on stage so that I would talk about the production on my radio show. Not because I was a tremendous theatrical performer. It was just they <laughs> wanted exposure. And so I'd get some sort of goofy walk on role that didn't make any difference. They could have hired anybody to do it. Um, but then in 2003, I got this crazy notion that um, I started to feel my mortality. And mm. I started to think, you know, there are things that I want to do in life. I had a bucket list. And one of them was to see if this beautiful face and this amazingly sleek physique could do anything on camera as well as on mic. So I'm thinking, you know, goofy frat boy that never grew up, crazy uncle uh, that you keep the kids away from, neighbor that's constantly complaining. Who knows? Sitcom city, right? Right. And so I decided I'm going to go for it. And I moved to Los Angeles and I trained with a great acting coach for about five years and did my radio show right up until 
I, I booked my first job on network television and then it was kind of the right time to get out of radio anyway because radio just was not a very pleasant place to work. There's a lot of consolidation and stuff. Mm. And then uh, things just clicked. And so um, <clears throat> I've ended up uh, doing probably 70 or 80 uh, shows, films, uh, actually more than a hundred. Um, and I was kind of handed a brand that I didn't expect. I was handed creepy evil villain. And I'm like, <laughs> but I'm not a creepy evil villain, but it's okay. It's fun. They have the best lines. They have the yeah. coolest weapons. They have the grandest plans. They have the hottest chicks. They have the, the, the <laughs> right. most, most awesome layers that they live in, they get they get the best lines in the script, right? So yeah. I, I just took to that like a fish to water. And so that plus I developed an app to memorize my lines because I needed one and it's turned out to be oh, something nice. that the industry needed as, as well. And then all along I've been doing voiceover. So I coach uh, voiceover and audiobook narrators. And that brings us to today where I am drinking a mocha from Starbucks. Yeah, I love it. I didn't know that you, your influence kind of with technology and that you created an app. I feel like that's brilliant of, uh, cause I think about this too. Like I, I have to memorize some stuff as I'm speaking and, um, it's very challenging for me. So my hack has been that I'll say it, I'll like record it in my phone and then I'll put an earbud in and listen to myself and say over it and over and over. But, right. Oh man. It's yeah. Yeah. But no, well, not a few times I'll do it, but then I actually like listen to myself and say it and I film while I'm listening to myself, which is Perfect. like really messes with your brain. I tell you what, that's actually called, but, like, that's actually that's called a brilliant something. app idea. Yeah. That's yeah. actually called something. It's called oh, really? IFB, IFB narration. Uh, people learned about it for the first time. The public learned about it for the first time when broadcast news, when Holly Hunter was feeding oh. the anchor lines and stuff. But, um, but the actual th the actual process of repeating lines right after you hear them as they're being fed in what's called an IFB uh, is something that some narrators like to do. And that's what the app does in a way. We, we don't have to do that in the world of on-camera work. But what the app does is called forced repetition. So you listen to yourself over and over and over again. Then you turn your lines off and you just listen to your scene partner's lines and you repeat that over and over and over again, trying different things out to see how it works. And it's called Rehearsal mm -hmm. Pro and you can use the app to film yourself, you know, doing the lines and, and seeing how you'd look on camera doing certain things, uh, playing with facial expressions and stuff like that. And yeah, it's been, wow. it's been out since 2010 and we have about 80,000 users around the, around the world and some really big names that you see on television and film all the time. It's, it's been a joy. It's been a joy and it continues to be. That's so cool. That and is so cool, David. Me. I totally want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where often the best ideas come from, right? Like we have a need and we just develop it. We make it for ourselves, and it ends up helping a lot of people. So I love that so much. Um, so, okay. So here's a question for you because you do, you are doing a lot of different things and you have done different things, but what is your zone of genius? Like the one thing that you're really good at doing that you also love, because sometimes we could be really great at something, but we don't love doing it. Like, what is that thing that you just love doing and you're great at? It's a great question. I, I like affecting people's thoughts and feelings. And that can take a number of different um, number of different processes and and results. Uh, for my voiceover students, I love being able to help them find their voice, find their their comfort zone, and then help them reach outside their comfort zone and give themselves the permission to really explore all the different options that their voice gives them. Um, I love helping people simply get started in things. Uh, and mm. just recently, I've started to explore, I'm training right now, uh, in voicing guided meditations. And Oh, wow. I, for the longest time, I was such a left brain person, I didn't even know where my right brain was. 
Uh, and then like in the last year or two, and I think it's been kind of uh, amplified by the pandemic and sort of the mental shape that many of us were or were not in. Uh, all of a sudden, I've been right. open to more woo-woo stuff. And uh, there's a part of me that feels guilty for waiting so long. And then there's a part of me that's like, look, mm. you have all these acts that have happened in your life. You know, you had a first act that was this and a second act that was that and a third act that was this and so on. Maybe there's a fourth, fifth and sixth act. Who knows? Um, totally. But this notion of just getting started on things prevents so many people from moving to their next act or moving to the next movement yeah. in the act that they're in. And I just okay. love helping people find the courage, uh, giving them the permission to fail, make mistakes, make a mess, move things around, uh, watch the dominoes fall prematurely and then set them back up again. Um, I, I just I just feel like that's that's something that I really enjoy doing, along with making people laugh, making people cry in my performance. So I think it's moving people to a different thought or feeling pattern. Mm, that is beautiful. And so necessary. Like, I think that the hardest part is getting started. And there is so much fear for people, especially if it's something new. Like I talk about this on my show where I had a lot of fear starting this show. I watched I, you say I was so. like, what are people going to think of me? Yeah. Yeah. It, like all the thoughts. Right. But I just, it, the pull to do it was so much louder. And so I finally just did it. And I'm very lucky to have an amazing support you know, system in my world. And I'm so thankful. It's like one of the most favorite things I get to do. And I'm so glad that I got to get started or that I did start and just do it and push through the fear. But p I had people that supported me to do that. And I love that that's how you're helping people. And that's your zone of genius. It's so needed. Yeah. I wonder how many things uh, we aren't experiencing right now that we would mm. absolutely adore, but the people haven't started yet. And yeah. I'd love to add to the add to the cacophony and 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 so I think that's one of my zones of genius, yeah. Mm, I love that. Total body chills with that David, you're so right. Um, you know, speaking of kind of just like the these fears, will you tell me a time when you had self-doubt or fear or insecurity in your business and how you overcame it? Um, well, I have it all the time and it brings to mind the word notice. Um, I've learned to notice it. I've learned to simply recognize it for what it is, notice it, acknowledge it, and then relate to the notion that it is not welcome in my life. Do I sound like I'm from like, you know, Hempville or what? Um, I just, I just feel like, you know, we, we tend to get paralyzed because we tell ourselves things. We have this voice that's going on in our head. We tell ourselves things. And usually we believe the first thing that we tell ourselves. And the first thing we tell ourselves is whatever's at the top of our list. You know, I'm an NLP, a uh, student of NLP, and I, I studied with one of the guys who studied with the originators of NLP. And one of the things that I've learned is that everyone has their list, their list of reactions, their menu of responses to things, and that we always, by default, automatically, knee-jerk, we respond with whatever's at the top of our list. This is everybody. This is nice people. This is uh, serial killers. This is hardcore uh, business people, um, uh, members of the clergy people who haven't yet learned how to react in certain situations. They see somebody else do something and they go, oh, that works for them. All right, I'll do that. And it goes to the top of their list, whatever it is at the top of your list. And like many people at the top of my list, when I'm presented with something new is a little bit of excitement, a little bit of trepidation, a little bit of, do I know enough to actually do this? Can I represent myself as somebody who's going to embark on this, this journey? And just being able to recognize that feeling of hesitancy, that feeling of there's this threshold that I'm about to cross. 
do I really want to do this? Do I really have the tools to do this? How about I don't care? How about I just do it and then see what happens? You know, and that to me is even more yeah. joyful than the safety of not doing it at all, not trying to do it, you know. And I think part of that, and this is kind of, you know, something that you you luck into. Uh, and you said we can swear on this show, right? Yeah. So right. my stepfather was a fucking asshole. And he was a long haul trucker who had no idea what his stepson was all about. He thought that being in drama club was stupid. The only thing he thought about computers in the 70s was those were these big boxes in a room somewhere that screwed up his paycheck every single week. That's what he thought because it was never enough for him. And he, he wasn't good at math, so he didn't realize. I went through his, you know, for him. I went through his, I'm like, no, this is right, Dad. This is not, you know. But he would spend his time discouraging me from doing what I wanted to do and making fun of me for doing what I wanted to do. He would say things like, why don't you get a real job? Why don't you go be a welder? Going to do radio, are you? You know, and there's a couple of ways to respond to that as a human being. Uh, you can believe all that and then go find a job as a welder. Or you can say, fuck you. You don't know what I do. You have no idea. You've got an eighth grade education, if that. You spent time in jail. Uh, no, I'm not looking to you for advice or to be a role model. And it lit a fire inside me that whenever somebody says, you're going to do what? You can't do that. I go, really? Watch me. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so mm -hmm. that kind of fire isn't something that, you know, there's a part of me that's like feels bad for people that grow up happy, that, you know, have a nice supportive life. Their parents are really loving and kind. I mean, that, there's so many good things about that. Yes. But the notion <laughs> that you can fight against people who will try to drag you down to their level or lower, and that's going to happen to you throughout your entire life, um, if, you can, if you can generate a fire that never is extinguished, He's been dead for 22 years, 23 years. And to this day, I'm still proving him wrong. And uh, it's a little emotional. But mm -hmm. I would rather have it that way than, uh, I guess, because I know it, than so some other uh, you know, framework to work in. It has lit a fire in me that has led me to do the things that I really want to do to provide solutions for other people that are useful and make them happy and make them successful. Um, I've trained over 2,600 people since I've been teaching voiceover for the last 10 or 15 years. I've watched them go on to do amazing things in the world of voice um, we have over 5,000 audiobooks in the uh, in the Audible marketplace that are for sale that my students have have voiced. Um, one of my students is the voice of Lexus worldwide. Uh, and and every so often, wow. someone will show up in a workout that I hold or a, a discussion group that I'm in and say, yeah, if it wasn't for you, X. And that just makes me so happy. And my own success comes out of that as well. I feel like I'm rambling. I haven't let you put a word in edgewise. Uh, I, I, I apologize for that. Go ahead. Oh, my God, David, you're not. I'm loving this so much. I mean, I just thank you so much for opening up and sharing. And I mean, thank goodness you did say fuck you to your stepdad because you just said all of these people that you have helped and help them push, get started, push through the fear and get going. And if you wouldn't have, if you would have listened to him, think of all the people that you wouldn't have been able to help. And I just think that it's hard for people to think that far ahead because it's so hard 
in your moment now in your position for if, you know, if people are in the same position as you or whatever that fear is, or the people that are holding you back to think about, but I could help other people. I could be happier. I want, like, I just want to follow my heart and we let people some, you know, sometimes control that and they just have no idea what is inside of our heart and, and see what we see, the vision that we have. And that's okay. You know, we can have these different visions, but I just, it's hard to take that next step for you. You know, you built this like fire inside and we're able to say, fuck you and keep going. Any advice for the person who maybe is listening to this? That's like, I have a situation in my life where I am kind of held back and I don't know how to take that next step. Any advice for that person? Sure. Um, and it depends on what you perceive to be holding you back. Um, the biggest mm -hmm. decision is whether or not what you perceive to be holding you back is real or it's simply made up in your head. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know. I have a personal definition for success that I say to my students all the time, and that is do more of what works and less of what doesn't, and you can't help but become more successful. The trick is knowing what works and what doesn't, and that's what I try to help my students and my production partners when I'm doing a show. That's what I try to do my best to, to help them find. You know, uh, one of the other things that I never would have been able to do uh, had I followed, you know, the advice of my stepfather is pursue a career in on-camera acting and be part of shows like Heroes and Lost and How I Met Your Mother and, you know, CSI, and I could name a million of them. But to be, just as an example, to be in a show like Heroes, which was one of the most expensive television shows ever produced, and to be in three seasons of it, and to be in those three seasons, beginning with what was supposed to be only one episode that I was in, I was supposed to be killed in the first episode that I was in, and midway through the first day of shooting, the writers and the executive producers went off to rewrite the rest of the season. And they came back wow. to me and they said, listen, we need to talk. I can tell you that that struck fear in my heart, right? But what they wanted to talk <laughs> yeah. about was me being in the next eight episodes and beyond. And who knows what feelings I've engendered in viewers of that show. If any, I get it's entertainment. It's not the most earth shattering thing in the world. But who knows? I met so many of them at cons and at, at events and overseas, around the country. Like I could not have had that kind of impact, uh, whatever that impact was. And so I want people who are stopped trying to figure out what it is that's holding them back, whether it's real or not. If you really want that impact, if you really want to make a difference, and if you want the satisfaction of self-happiness, of, of being happy doing what you're doing, You'll never know until you actually take that first step. And as I said earlier, a lot of people don't take that first step because they're fearful of failure. And I can help you with that so easily. You're going to fail. Don't worry about it. It's, <laughs> right. it's a done deal. Right. You're going to fail in some cases spectacularly with fireworks and a marching band. And you're going to be like, <laughs> wow, this is the worst thing ever. But the good news is... Now you know at least one thing that doesn't work. So do less of that. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe you're not, you know, correct. You're not going to fail that one time. You're going to find out something that works. And there's going to be yeah. satisfaction. There's going to be happiness. And you can put it in the column of things that work. So do more of that and less of the thing that you failed at. It's fine. You're going to make a mess. And you have to be comfortable with the notion that you can make a mess but it can be a very valuable experience to make that mess, not something to be embarrassed about. That's what learning's all about, right? So, yeah, I, I think I, I answered it. your question I, there, right? You absolutely did. You absolutely did. I needed to hear that too. The first part is like, is this real or not? You know, like, is this made up in my head or is this like an actual thing that's holding me back that I can solve? And I, time and time again, at least for me, it's been 
in my head. And so just having that recognition, the notice, you mentioned that too, and then being able to, because I think that does help make it a lot easier to get going once you first determine that. Yeah. Um, David, if you had to do it all over again, this is a big question, but if you had to do it all over again, what's the number one thing you would do differently? I would have moved to Los Angeles in the early 80s. Uh, I used to have a feeling when I came out here, like it was so awesome. And I still feel that way now that I live here in Los Angeles. Um, I would have done it earlier in life. I would have. Um, and I know there are a lot of people who go, I wouldn't change a goddamn thing. Okay, great. You know, That's and I right. could <laughs> do exactly what I've done. I've had one of the best lives that people, if everything came to a close tomorrow, uh, I've had one of the best lives that people could possibly have in terms of personal feelings and feelings of success and, and accomplishment and achievement. Um, but I've often said, why did I wait until I was nearly 50 to move to Los Angeles and pursue a career on camera? Uh, I would have likely, uh, I, I came to LA many times in the early 80s, uh, traveling for radio and traveling with friends who were, were living out here and stuff. And every time I was here, I was like, oh, this is so awesome. So awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then went back to Connecticut or New York City or Washington, D.C. or wherever I was at the time. And that I would have done differently. Now, that in and of itself means that some of the life experiences that I had may or may not have occurred. And so who knows right. where that would have put me in terms of my career, but I would have pursued on camera acting earlier. Um, and that's about it. I wish I had, like, I feel yeah. like I've seen things coming down the pike and gone, huh, Macintosh, 1984, huh. I'm going to go to Higby's and I'm going to buy one of those, you know, Higby's in Cleveland, twenty four ninety five for my first Mac, you know, uh, and then sort of choosing that path all along the way. And it's worked out just great. Uh, the web uh, podcasting. I was one of the first podcasters back in the 90s before it was called podcasting. Right. It just hit me. <laughs> and great. and again, because I was fighting that that, you know, bullshit advice that I got from my stepfather. I was like, yeah, whatever, well, let's try it. How hard could it be, you know, to just try? I'm not saying how hard could it be to be good at it, but, you know, it doesn't feel like there's a big barrier to entry here for any of this stuff. Making the decision to work on camera was a huge life shift. And I was lucky because I had a syndicated radio show on XM and Sirius uh, on the CNET network. And uh, so I had kind of a cushion. I had a war chest. Uh, and I suggest that before you pursue any career in performance, you have some sort of war chest either that you can continue to add to or that you have built up. Don't spend too much time, but, you know, give yourself some sort of a safety net, because if you don't, it may contribute to a premature cessation of your pursuit of whatever it is that you want to do. So give yourself every opportunity. But. Uh, yeah, that's that's the one thing that I think I would have done differently. I would have come out here and pursued uh, on camera acting a little bit earlier. Mm. You know, it's funny because I well, I don't know if it's funny, but I think you know this about me. We've talked about this when we were in Durango together, but I've always wanted to act like I've thought I've wanted to act. I've never tried be so it good. before, but I really like. Oh, well, I feel like I would love it. Um, I love performing and, you remind and me that's of Jennifer where like, I love Aniston. doing this show. What's that? You remind me of Jennifer Aniston. Oh my goodness. Wow. I mean, How I've do seen... I remind you of Jennifer Aniston? That's well, awesome. <laughs> we, we have, we're having this conversation now. It's kind of, 
you know, a podcasty conversation. We're both trying to look great on camera and, right. and speak well and be effective and perform and entertain. But I've been with you at events. I sat next to you at Social Media Marketing World. We were watching Loria yeah. uh, show off uh, whatever she was showing off that day. Yeah. And I've seen you in situations with Jeff Walker, with with uh, other uh, things that we've we've done together. I've seen you in normal everyday situations. And truly, people don't get why actors like Jennifer Aniston always play the same part. Because those parts represent very, very familiar parts of them. And you are one of the most authentic people I know. Watching your podcast episode with Una Duncan, I was just sitting there, you know, gripping my my, my chair and going, two of the most awesome women in the world next to each other talking and I can see it on my phone and I can see it on my computer. This is the coolest yeah. thing ever. We, we li we're living in the future. Where's my rocket pack? You know, it's like, it's awesome. And that and how sweet you are and how intelligent you are and how beautiful you are and how funny you are. Uh, stop me if I'm embarrassing you. That's not my point. That's what I feel about people like Jennifer Aniston and, and you know, um, I don't know. There's probably a million different people. But that's who comes to mind because you kind of resemble her. So if you have that, you're younger than I was when I made the decision to pursue that. And I'm not saying drop everything that you do, move back to Los Angeles, become an actor, <laughs> go to New York, do whatever, because it's a crappy right. life sometimes, you know? <laughs> sure. The rejection in our industry oh. is 99.9% .9 of the time. Even with the people that you think work all the time, they get no, they get the answer no far more often than they get the answer yes. Even when they work, quote unquote, all the time. Because of the numbers, there's far fewer opportunities to act than there are people who are either actors or want to be actors or want to tell their family that they are actors. Whatever it is, the numbers don't work out in our favor as actors. But I absolutely, but I'm sorry, I feel like I interrupted you and I, and I brought the conversation to all. No. Go, go for it. Oh so my God, said, no, I love, I mean, thank you for saying all that. I love that you did say that. And I'd like to just point out that you said that I was funny. And I want to be funny. I want to do stand-up comedy. And some people say I'm do. more cheesy and goofy. Wait, 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 but wait. Time I, out. Uh, you yeah, do. Yeah. You do on this show. You're on stage. Yeah, that's you're true. You're doing stand-up. That's true. You're sitting, you're drinking wine while you're doing it, but you're doing stand-up. Yeah. You know? And if you yeah. want to go to where where are you living now? Denver, Boulder? Where where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins, okay. There's gotta be clubs all around the area that have open mic nights. Yeah. And you're probably going to get more time on mic than people here in Los Angeles. Because here in Los Angeles, there are 4 million people who want to do stand-up comedy, I'm sure. Right. Where you right. are, probably not. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a great point. I know. Yeah. That is on my list. I got to do it in 2022 is I have to do at least one stand-up, like at least get out there, you know what I mean? And try it because I have this vision of what I think it will be, but I think it'll be fun. But anyways, um, I want to, I just, I'm loving this conversation, David. I feel like we could talk forever and ever and ever. Uh, but I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to know what are, what is your curiosity right now? Like what kind of questions, I'm a very curious person and I love knowing where people's curiosity is. So what kind of questions have you been asking yourself lately? I've been asking myself really big questions lately. Uh, like, are we going to survive as a species? And is our world going to be livable in 10 or 15 or 20 years? Am I going to be alive to see our our world change in a way that at the very least allows us to persevere and continue and maybe even thrive if we fix some of the problems that we've created for ourselves. And, you know, I, I'm not, I don't consider myself to be, you know, ultra progressive, you know, uh, but I do see what's happening to our environment and I see what's, and I see what's happening to people who want to preserve their ability to make money. And I'm talking mostly about politicians, you know, because once you serve as a politician, there's a very good chance 
you can become wealthy after that, especially if you move up to like the federal government. And I see a lot of people just trying to maintain their seat at the table by being Mm -hmm. assholes, by having contra that you have a, a representative there in your state who continually puts herself uh, at the forefront of asininity. And I don't care if there's somebody watching this who disagrees with me, good for you. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's not productive and it's not even unproductive in a way that, that, that insinuates productivity when it's presented, like shaking things up and rocking the boat to make things better. That's not making things better. That's being an asshole. And we've forgotten entirely what it's about to serve our fellow uh, fellow citizen as a representative in politics. We're now doing so so we can write a book or doing so so we can move on to a higher office and make more money and get more lobbyists contributing to our and maybe even doing things illegal. Um, and the fear that we, that some politicians have of not towing the line of what their party demands that they say, that's not serving the public. And they would turn around and go, if they were really being truthful, they go, I don't fucking care about serving the public. I care about being on CNN or Fox news or, or, you know, having penguin random house coming after me with a book deal. That's what I care about. I care about making money as a lobbyist when I get out there. There's like all of these things that. We've we've created for ourselves as goals that don't serve. And I'm hoping that at some point there's a real renaissance in our country. And that we realize that simply to survive, not even to thrive, but to survive, we need to work hard, put our, our eyes on the real prize, the real goal and change some things for the better or we're all going to die. It's going to happen. Yeah. We got no choice. Yeah. And those that milk. deny that simply right. are denying that. They're not they have no basis in in fact to do that, you know. So those that's one thing that I'm thinking about. But like I said earlier in the interview, I'm also thinking about things that aren't necessarily left brain database-based uh provable uh things to do. And if you'd asked me 3 years ago if that was something that was on my agenda, I'd be nope. I'm a spreadsheet guy. Show me the data. I want to see the data. I'm not at all interested whatsoever in your woo woo, uh, you know, hologram problems already been solved. We have we just have a quantum, you know, and and to a degree, I'm still very skeptical of a lot of the things that I hear. I, I think the last domino that's going to fall for me in that space, and I don't know if you're an adherent to this, I am diametrically opposed to the secret. To the attraction principle, uh, because it gives people false hope. It, 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 it assigns a meaning to someone's success or a cause to someone's success that I think is disingenuous, is false, and doesn't give that person the credit they deserve. There's a part of me that cringes a little bit when I see artists or athletes accept awards and the very first thing they do is thank Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, God is the reason that I'm here and all that. Look, I get it. I love being spiritual. I love the idea of that. But to give away your power and your accomplishments and to, whether it's God or it's some guru that you're following or some ethereal, universal, the universe is talking to you, kind of an attraction thing. And if I'm offending you, I apologize. That's not my point. I feel like we tend not to give ourselves enough enough credit to begin with. And going back to that whole hesitancy when just getting started, you know, like all of a sudden, uh, it wasn't us that did it to begin with. It was some (laughs) higher power, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, is that you can't believe you are the master of your own destiny and follow those things and then give that all away to some higher power in my book and be consistent, right? And I've never been a religious person. I think it started when I was young and I was raised in a Jewish household. And as a a seven-year-old, I was told, oh, you need to buy tickets to go to temple. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. You need to buy tickets. How much are the tickets? $35. $35? 
to, to go to temple? Well, it's the high holidays, you know, and then, you know, you realize religions are all about raising money. They either ask for tithing or they ask for donations or they sell tickets. You know, it's like one way or another, the church is right. going to make money. And look at what the wealthiest organization in the world is. It's the Catholic Church. So I, I, I feel like I'm I'm setting you up to get hate mail like crazy on this <laughs> podcast episode. And I apologize. But you asked me what I was thinking about. And that was your first mistake. So, <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god, so, I love it. You know, I might. There might there's definitely going to be some people who disagree which but that's okay. I love I mean, it's so okay. Here's my thing is that we of course are not going to have the same thoughts and feel the same way. Same as like how we how if I like this wine, I think it's the best wine. And you're like this is the worst wine and it's Robert Mondavi and he's standing right behind you. Like Tastes like a gamay. It, we can have the yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can have these different opinions. What kills me, especially, and you know, I feel like we see this more now lately is just how mean people are if you have a different opinion and will just attack you. And of course, with technology, there's so many beautiful things, but also it allows people to have this courage behind the screen and just go off on people and tear them down. And it's very sad, but I just, it's like, just people are leaving their families and friends because they disagree. And I just like, it breaks my heart when that happens. So I just, I'm like, you know what? It's okay if we disagree, but yeah. yeah. I had a friend who I'd known since I was in radio in DC in the early nineties. I worked at a country station for a hot 10 minutes and I worked with her and we were friends. Uh, her daughter wanted to be an actor and in the mid 2000s, she, you know, we'd been talking online and stuff. And she said, Hey, my, my daughter's coming up. Can you, do you have some recommendations? Can you mentor her? Can you, and I'm like, I'd be thrilled. And she ended up acting as well, the mom. And then in 2016, I told her that I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, because I'm a libertarian, I voted for the libertarian ticket. I didn't vote for Trump for sure. And, but it didn't matter. The fact that I didn't vote for Hillary was a breaking point for her. And it didn't matter that in California, there was no fucking way that anybody was going to win besides Hillary. Right. It just that's the way our state runs. And right. it doesn't matter. But my choice is my choice. And her choice was to separate from me and to ghost me. And she moved to, I think, Colorado um, and doesn't talk to anybody anymore who she doesn't agree with. And I get that she needs to maintain mental acuity and mental um, calmness. And and it's fragile when, especially because our leaders have given, a, given us all permission to be total dicks. You know, yeah. they, they, they've, totally. ex they've led by example. And yeah. they've shown us that, you know, there was always this space to be an asshole that nobody ever assumed because our former leaders taught us to be respectful and courteous to a degree. I mean, everybody gets into fights and they get loud, but not like has what's been happening, the tribalism and the, the hardcore mean tribalism that's been happening. And it feeds on itself. It's like once you realize you can do it and it, it gives you that dopamine hit to own the libs or, you know, uh, capture the Trump's, Trumpistas or whatever you're doing with your particular thing. Well, that feeds on itself. That makes it even worse the next time. And then other people join in and it's like mob mentality. It's awful. And it's going to lead to our demise. It's going to right. lead to our demise. That's what I've been thinking about recently. So. Yep. Yep. I've been thinking about that stuff too, David. It's a definitely heavy thoughts, but I mean, you kind of feel like, you know, how can you not be thinking about some of these things? And hopefully uh, there's a, it's a good ending to that act. Um, you know, I, Final question here for you that I wonder if it's in line with what we're talking about or if it's in the woo-woo space since you're getting more in there or maybe it's somewhere totally different. What are what have you watched or read 
recently that you would really recommend? So first of all, I feel like the the bane of our existence is what's been happening with the amount of content that's been produced over the last five to 10 years. You know, when we were growing oh, up, yeah. and I'm a little older than you are, when we were growing up, there were three network television stations in every town. Maybe there was a public television station, and maybe there was the independent station that showed uh, Speed Racer and Kimba the Lion and Spider-Man and Ultraman, and and they had some goofy, you know, late night Friday shock host that would do old horror films. Anyway, that was then. <laughs> This right. is now. The network television stations, now there's four. There's ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. There's PBS. There's basic cable. There's premium cable. There's additional cable. There's over-the-top boxes, set-top boxes, the Netflix and the Hulus and the Amazons of the world. And the amount of content that is being produced, not just by that group, but also the independent channels like just YouTube, Instagram, right. uh, who knows what's coming down the pike, right? Seriously. Yeah. And people go, Hey, have you seen such and such? Like there's a movie coming out as we're, as we're recording this, this weekend, uh, called the Adam project, which is the, the, the pre chatter on this is it's this generation's ET. It's a sci-fi oh. action flick. That's also a family film. And, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get to it. I have a stack on all right. of it. You know, so what I've watched recently, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be honest with you. I got hooked on Joe Millionaire. And I watched Joe oh, Millionaire. Oh, you're kidding me. And I'm, I watched the final <laughs> last night. Look, I've, I've, I, you know, in my defense, I've watched other really much more important things. I really have. I watched We've Got to Talk yeah. About Bill Cosby. <laughs> I, I have, uh, you know, I watch the LBJ thing. I watch Frontline all the time. So I have my check-ins on the stuff that matters. But right. I'm yelling at my yeah. television last night. No, uh, not her. She's a gold digger. No, uh, no, you know, I'm yelling at my television and I'm like, this is why I became an actor to make people do what I'm doing right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. This is why I'm a I'm about to launch this year's edition of my audiobook training. When I get off this with you, I've got some mails to send out for that because I want nice. people to be able to make people yell at their televisions or yell at their their iPhones or whatever they're listening to their audiobooks and podcasts on and go no or yes or whatever, right? Or laugh or yeah. cry. So I had to be really honest with you. That's the last thing that I watched. I Love it. That is amazing, David. I was not at all expecting that. Not at all. And I love it so much. And I just, I get what you're saying. Create that content that, that pr makes people feel a certain way. Like, it's amazing that that we have that ability to do it. And you're so right. Like, oh my gosh, there's so much content. It's crazy how much is being produced and it's just impossible to keep up with everything. Now you make me feel like I want to watch Joe Millionaire because I love the love shows. I watch like Love is Blind and Married at First Sight and all the things, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I will see. Um, yeah. Uh, so David, where can people find out more about you? And you just mentioned new training that's coming out. Will you tell us a little bit about that as well? Uh, sure. Um, throughout the course of the year, I teach two major courses. Uh, one is called the ACX Masterclass. ACX is the platform that Audible created to hook up authors with narrators and turn their books into audiobooks. And I teach people how to build a business on that, and that's at acxmasterclass.com. Um, I have an ongoing, huge curriculum of training for voiceover in general, including audiobooks, but also all the other categories, excuse me, and building your business and the, how the technology works, how to pick a mic, how to use the sound software, um, and the mindset more than anything, because that's like what most people, they kind of shy away from teaching that stuff. And I've just embraced it. I love it. It's called VO Heroes, and that's at voheroes.com. 
Um, and then uh, if you want to know more about me as an actor, David H. Lawrence, XVII dot com. That's and I'm on all the I'm on all the social networks. Just you, you can usually just search for Roman numeral 17 XVII and you'll find me. So, um, yeah, oh, cool. that's where I'm at. Love it. Love it. We'll link to everything as well. Um, David, this was such a great conversation. We talked about a lot of different things. Like we definitely had an open and honest conversation today. I so appreciate your time and just opening up and sharing with my audience. So one cheers here. Thank you so much, David. Cheers to you with your Starbucks with the lid on correctly. Yeah. And it all originated from you. Uh, and thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for tuning in. Like I said, we'll link to everything. And I please, will everybody see you on the next Please, everybody, tell your friends. Week. Please, everybody, tell your friends about Crystal Uncorked. Please support her. Uh-oh. Please, you know, generate a following for this that has extra zeros on it from where it is now. Because she's awesome. Let's, let's, let's talk about her as though Aww. she isn't really here. <laughs> Oh, I love it, David. Thank you for saying that. I would love for more people to join this world and interview more people like you and have these conversations and just be able to help. So definitely share it if you guys are finding value in this. David, thank you for everything today. I hope we get to see each other in person sooner than later and um, have a great rest of your day and I'll see you on the next. See you, everybody. Thanks, David. Bye. All right, let's keep this conversation going. Join me on Instagram. I'm at Crystal Uncorked. And I need to tell you thank you so much for listening to this show. It truly means the world to me. If you're enjoying Crystal Uncorked, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Okay, I'll see you on the next CU. Cheers, friend.